something or someone had knocked over the fifth iceberg and it was lying broken on the lawn. So this could be my bad. It's a good idea to leave around two to three centimeters or one inch of clear space where the mulch is not actually touching the collar of that trunk. There's this tiny slither of capillaries and cells that is still connected. And that's why I've brought the gaffer tape with me and some twine. And I'm gonna try to just create a protective cocoon for this. So it can at least still attempt to pump water up to the rest of the plant. So who did this? So what would you do if two thirds of the way into a detective story, you'd already nailed this suspect, already solved it? Well, of course, in a good story, there's always much more to it than, than initially meets the eye. The extra twist. What would I do? I'd find another suspect. The mad genius hiding in plain sight kind. In part two, I said that I reckon it was a cat mid-fight that took this iceberg out. I still do. But I also have one more suspect to offer up. Perhaps this one acted with, or was in league with, all the other suspects, or all the other elements or parts that contributed to this iceberg falling over. This one is... Mm, no. I don't think I'm ready to give this suspect up just yet. Because first up, we should talk a bit more about the characteristics of an iceberg. Because roses, like people, all have different personalities and habits. And one of the ones an iceberg has is that it flowers incredibly late into the season. It's still happily pushing out flowers while the other roses have shut their shops, as autumn turns wintry. It's worth considering this as you fade out your feeding structure at the end of the season. If you can, close it all down just before that hot weather runs out. It's tempting to give them one more feed, to really power this late display. Winters are kinder here, and optimistic flowers will make their move. There's no frost lurking with those spiky, icy fingers, which will dispatch any new growth or buds foolish enough to linger. But even here in these milder winters, I personally think it's better to not overcrank them. All organic systems benefit from a period of rest and regeneration to restore that system's cycles rather than just keep smashing flowers out all year round like some energy drink drenched toddler chucking a tantrum at bedtime. These late showy iceberg displays bring so much lift and color to parts of the garden. They're really much appreciated when autumn comes. Although I personally stop feeding them at the same time as the others because I also want their systems to prepare for a change in habits and patterns as the seasons migrate. Icebergs can produce a really satisfying show of rose hips, rather like miniature red apples, neatly marching to the colors of autumn. Okay, about that suspect. No more typewriters. No. Perhaps this one acted with, or was an element that worked with all the other suspects or parts that contributed to this iceberg falling over. This one is simply old age. It is easy to picture a flying cat smashing into a brittle iceberg and scattering it like, a, like an antique skittle. But in fairness, I don't think they would fall over unless they were in this dilapidated and weathered state in the first place. Still, there's immense beauty in this old age. I don't know how much longer they have. There's huge cracks in some of the limbs. They also have endemic fungal disease hosted within the soil. But you know, they're still knocking out things of, of such beauty, like this chewed up flower, almost dainty in its destruction. And perhaps that sums them up quite nicely. The leopard spots on these new lime green leaves already infected. The ever optimistic rose hips, the insurance, making their plans for continuity and succession. The cracked, lichen-rich limbs, from a distance, 
from our distance, you can see the cycle locked in. You can see the commuters. Through older age, these icebergs' path is a procession of life. So anyway, who did eat that flower? Yeah, Katie did. Icebergs are one of the most popular roses in the world. But there's another user of the garden that also chooses iceberg over all other brands and leaves a striking pattern as a stamp of approval. The leaf-cutting bee leaves these circles. This solitary bee cuts an impressive arc in the leaf, which she uses as the cap on each cell for each of her offspring, who she leaves with a trove of nectar and food beneath the green roof of their deluxe sleeping pod. Quite fittingly, I've not been able to capture her on camera, so she's left her handiwork, but I have no way of showing you the actual artist behind this. My rule is that I only use my own original material on Rose's Edge. I have another image of a bee that I really love, but obviously it's the wrong one. It is blue though. The leaf cutting bee is a good pollinator, something we desperately need in this world right now, amid the plight of the honeybees. This is a meet the neighbors moment. Here's coral to this iceberg's right. Just one circle here. Immediately to the left is the rambling rector. This is a big plant, but I could only see two circles here. She prefers the iceberg. I don't know why this is. Perhaps softer or more abundant new growth or a preference for those early lime green tones. But please, let her cut her shapes. She doesn't damage your rose in any way, and in fact stimulates the plant to produce more leaves. Learn to look at this as a bespoke pattern maker, customising your plant for a brief time. You don't need to nuke this one with pesticides, which will only take out a valuable pollinator and other helpful visitors to your roses, and she will have likely already moved on by the time you spot these patterns. So the absolute truth is, these icebergs are a bit knackered, but that's okay. Although the state of this park does tell its own story. And at this point, you'd have to add another subject. This one is ants, or even worse, termites. And this garden is situated very close to the forest, which means the nature can still be very raw, even on a rose. Ants won't eat living wood, although they do colonise decayed wood, but generally in the garden they're hard-working neighbours, and not pests, aside from a rose's perspective of using the same skills as humans to farm. In their case, aphids. These industrious sugar ants have an extensive nest nearby, but I don't think they're the cause of the degradation of the wooden bark so evident in these icebergs. And while these ants are creating their own mounds here, around our raspberry canes, thanks guys, it's more likely to be termite damage from underground on these icebergs. Although I can't see any termite tubes, the spit and mud freeways which they use to move about above ground, they are here in this garden. If you're a plant, I can't think of anything that would aid you quite like having, you know, a merciless colony of obsessive wood-eating subterranean tunnelers living directly below you. But again, there's a rawness and proximity to nature in this place. In the end, the iceberg's will to live has mostly withstood these attacks. But should we expect them to survive a wider onslaught from everything, the age, the termites, and the weight of flying cat bodies mid-fight, 
all at once? Well, not really. And yet, they're still flowering across all and more of the season, and they continue to support and sustain a wider ecosystem, living on and off and around them, occupying this space in the line for nearly a quarter of a century. And I think that makes them really special roses. I'll keep you up to date with how it all goes with Iceberg 5. In the meantime, as ever, thanks again for watching and making it through to the end. See ya. Take care.